well guys uh, last time i told you that uh, how gastrointestinal smooth muscle behaves like a sensation and then i told you about the arrangement of bundles in each muscle layer that how each bundle is uh, separate and uh, connected as well keep in mind that a connection between circular and longitudinal smooth muscle layer that also exists recall that we were discussing the uh, general principles of uh, motility this uh, motility is uh, brought about by two types of contractions in git phasic uh, which you can also term rhythmic and uh, tonic contractions now the uh, gi motility is achieved through electrical activity of smooth muscle so today we will start with this uh, electrical activity in these uh, muscle layers there are some uh, ground facts like the normal resting membrane potential in the smooth muscle fibers of the gut that is between minus 50 to minus 60 millivolt and uh, the uh, smooth muscles of gastrointestinal tract is excited by continual slow electrical activity we can look at the electrical activity in this way also that uh, there are two basic types of electrical waves the first one are slow waves which arise between minus 60 and minus 40 millivolt and they usually are of uh, 15 millivolt magnitude the other variety is uh, spikes or we may call it spike potential let's first explore the slow waves which form the basic electrical rhythm slow waves are actually slow undulating changes in the resting membrane potential and the rhythm of uh, gastrointestinal contractions is determined by the frequency of these slow waves now this frequency differs in different parts of the human gid for example it is uh, 3 per minute in the body of the stomach 12 per minute in the duodenum and around 8 to 9 per minute in uh, terminal ileum well what you have to keep in mind is that these uh, slow waves they are not action potentials the description of uh, slow waves it remains incomplete if we don't mention the interstitial cells of kajal which uh, serve to be electrical pacemakers for smooth muscle cells and i assume that you can guess the connection of this gentleman's photo with the cells of kajal shape of uh, these cells has been described as a uh, stellate shape mesenchymal cells with the smooth muscle like features these specialized cells form a network with each other they are uh, interposed between smooth muscle layers in such a way that uh, they are also connected with the smooth muscle cells by gap junctions so that uh, electrical activity generated by these cells spread to the adjacent smooth muscle cells
you will see now that how uh, these interstitial cells of Kajal actually set the pace. They undergo cyclic changes in the membrane potential due to unique ion channels that periodically open and produce inward pacemaker currents that generate slow waves. In stomach and small intestine, uh, these cells are located in uh, outer circular muscle layer near the myenteric plexus, while in colon, uh, they are at uh, submucosal border of uh, circular muscle layer. As I already told you that the rate of basic electrical rhythm uh, that varies in different parts of gut. For example, it's lowest in stomach and highest in duodenum. Now, uh, in colon, that rate, it rises from about 2 per minute at cecum to about 6 per minute at sigmoid uh, keep in mind that uh, in stomach and small intestine there is a descending gradient in the pacemaker frequency where the pacemaker with the highest frequency dominates this uh, basic electrical rhythm is uh, significant because it coordinates the peristaltic and other motor activity. Uh, for example, after vigotomy or the transaction of the stomach wall, the peristalsis in the stomach, it becomes irregular and chaotic. Coming back to slow waves, uh, one more thing you shouldn't forget is that slow waves usually do not cause muscle contraction. Instead, they excite appearance of intermittent spike potentials and these spike potentials excite the muscle contraction. As I already told you that slow wave potential is uh, different from uh, action potential because slow wave itself is not an action potential, but it can give rise to action potential. And now you might wonder that how so? Uh, what happens is that slow wave uh, potentials, they fire the action potentials only when they reach the threshold. In short, you can say that uh, slow waves themselves cannot cause muscle contractions unless they generate the action potentials or the depolarization of contraction threshold. Hmm. Vexing and veining of uh, pumping of sodium ion outward through the membrane of fiber that is the main cause of rhythmicity in smooth muscle. Another important point which you shouldn't forget is that uh, it's a self regenerative process that spreads progressively over the whole membrane. Sometimes the cause of rhythmicity could be certain ion channels, for example, the calcium ion or sodium ion channels which open periodically. Well, the description so far should make the significance of the slow waves in resting membrane potential clear, which is that uh, uh, this kind of potential leads to spontaneous generation of action potentials in uh, unitary muscle and makes it uh, self excitatory. In other words, it causes uh, pacemaker activity and hence the rhythmical contractions in uh, unitary smooth muscle. And the example is uh, peristaltic activity in gut. Now, the question is that why slow waves do not cause muscle contraction? As you all know that uh, smooth muscle contraction occurs in response to entry of calcium ions into the muscle fiber. While the slow waves, they do not cause calcium ions to enter GI muscle fiber. Instead, the slow waves, they cause entry of sodium ions only. It is only during spike potentials when significant quantities of calcium ions they enter the fibers. Hmm. 
Now, my dear, uh, without further suspense, let's uh, move on to spike potentials, which are the true action potential. These spikes, uh, these spikes occur when uh, the resting membrane potential, or in other words, you can say the peaks of the slow waves, they become more positive than uh, minus 40 millivolt. Uh, let me tell you certain specific features of these uh, spike potentials, such as their frequency, duration, etc. 1 to 10 spikes per second is the usual frequency. But then again, it depends on the basic uh, rhythm, which means that uh, higher the slow wave potential rises, greater will be the frequency of the spike potentials. Now the duration is uh, 10 to 40 times as long as uh, action potential in nerve, which makes it around uh, 10 to 20 milliseconds. This comparatively longer duration is because of the slowness of opening and closing of calcium sodium channels. In a spike potential, depolarization is caused by slow calcium sodium channel when they allow a especially large number of calcium ions to enter along with smaller number of sodium ions. And uh, repolarization is caused by the opening of uh, our very cute voltage gated potassium channels. <sighs> Maybe not that cute, but I'm trying to make it less dry a topic for you. From what I just uh, told you about depolarization, you can guess that uh, movement of a large number of calcium into cell during action potential of a spike, it causes muscle contraction. Since muscle fibers are connected with uh, one another by gap junctions, allowing flow of uh, ions from fiber to fiber, this turns them into a functional syncytium. Now, uh, here is an uh, interesting twist which says that uh, changes also takes place in the voltage of resting membrane potential. These changes occur in addition to slow waves and spike potentials. So what does it mean that uh, the baseline voltage level of uh, smooth muscle <clears throat> resting membrane potential, it can also change. Under normal conditions, the resting membrane potential averages about minus 56 millivolt. But there are multiple factors which can change this level as you can see in this figure. When uh, resting membrane potential becomes uh, less negative, it is called depolarization of the membrane and uh, in these situations, the muscle become more excitable. And when uh, RMP becomes more negative, it is called hyperpolarization of the membrane, which makes the muscle less excitable. Here, the uh, depolarization in which uh, the potential becomes more positive and muscle becomes more excitable, that is caused by stretch, acetylcholine, parasympathetic stimulation, and some specific GIT hormones. Now, as you can guess that uh, for hyperpolarization, in which the potential becomes more negative and the muscle becomes less excitable, the hyperpolarizing factors, they could be epinephrine and uh, norepinephrine. Also the sympathetic stimulation, which mainly causes uh, norepinephrine secretion. And let me introduce you to yet another character of our GI story, which is the tonic or sustained contraction. A tonic contraction is a continuous contraction, often lasting for minutes or hours. These contractions are not associated with basic electrical rhythm of slow waves. 
and uh, their intensity can be increased or decreased but it is always present interestingly uh, some smooth muscles of grt exhibit tonic contractions as well as uh, or instead of the rhythmical contractions uh, now if i give you a question in test uh enlist the causes of tonic contraction your answer should comprise of three factors first of all the repetitive spike potentials whose greater frequency will result in greater degree of contractions as you can see in the figure then there are hormones or certain other chemical factors which uh, bring about continuous partial depolarization without causing action potential and finally the continuous entry of calcium into cell interior brought about in ways which are not associated with changes in the membrane potential also could result in uh, the tonic contraction well to give you a better image i am going to name the areas of git where uh, tonic contractions uh, appear these are rings or bands of muscles means the sphincters that separate different sections of uh, digestive system for example the uh, upper and lower esophageal sphincter which close off the two ends of esophagus um pyloric sphincter which is located between stomach and small intestine and the sphincter of ordi which uh, controls flow of bile and pancreatic juices into the small intestine now this uh, figure gives you the summary of uh, the electrophysiology and the contraction of the gi smooth muscle and next we are going to learn that how this electrical activity is uh, regulated uh i told you that the next part of our chapter 63 that is the general principles regarding nervous and uh, hormonal control of uh, gi functions um this control of uh, gi functions it may be divided into three modalities uh intrinsic neural control that is exerted through enteric nervous system while the extrinsic neural control it comprises of uh, gi supply of autonomic nervous system and then there is hormonal control of uh, gastrointestinal motility so we are going to explore one by one that uh, how these control modalities regulate the functions of git first uh, let's focus on uh, nervous control and uh, let's start with the um, enteric nervous system which gives uh, intrinsic control this system uh, which is also called a uh, gut brain or uh, little brain it's a highly developed control system its number of neurons are 100 million which is nearly equal to the number in entire spinal cord will ask me why enteric system is called brain of the gut there are two reasons one it can uh, integrate the sensory information and uh, effect a complex motor response independent of the cns and uh, then the enteric nervous system releases a variety of neurotransmitters just like cns and hence you get the name gut brain enteric nervous system uh, begins in esophagus and extends to anus now the neurons can be Uh, excitatory or inhibitory 
and their activity can be modified by extrinsic nerves. Also the uh, sensory nerve endings which uh, originate in uh, the gastrointestinal epithelium or gut wall, they send efferent fibers to the enteric system and these fibers they are responsible for uh, uh, local effects and also some uh, reflexes. Uh, while observing this figure, what you should focus on is that uh, our enteric nervous system consists of uh, ganglionic and uh, aganglionic plexuses. Ganglionated ones are mainly two plexuses. There is an inner plexus which is called Meissner's or submucosal plexus for excretion and local blood flow control and uh, outer plexus is there for movement control mainly. This one is uh, also called myenteric or orbic plexus and it uh, lies uh, in intramuscular plane between two layers of muscularis propria. Now both these plexuses they are connected to autonomic system for extrinsic control and uh, also connected to each other. Both usually contain many interstitial cells of Kajal also. But uh, still the enteric system it can function independently of these uh, extrinsic nerves now the aganglionic plexuses they lie in uh, other planes in gut wall. I, I hope you know what a ganglion is. A ganglion is a compact body covered with a, a collagen sheath and it contains nerve cell bodies and the processes embedded in dense stoma of neurites and Schwann cells. Now the interganglionic fascicles of uh, nerve processes connect the adjacent ganglia while the ganglion cells they are variable in form well who knows these various forms they probably have different functions and for your better understanding you should uh, study this figure as you know the uh, submucosal plexus which is uh, located in the submucosal layer is uh, concerned mainly with controlling function within the inner wall of each minute segment of intestine. Now many sensory signals originate from uh, the gastrointestinal epithelium which are integrated in the submucosal plexus to control the local effects. Then there are some regional modifications also like uh, the intestine, it has a bilayered submucosal plexus while the esophagus lacks ganglia in the submucosal plexus. Local uh, intestinal functions which are controlled by submucosal plexus are excretion, absorption, blood flow, local contraction of uh, muscles in the deep parts of mucosa. Now uh, have a look uh, at this uh, figure and uh, you can see that uh, my enteric or the orbax plexus which uh, extends along the entire length of uh, gastrointestinal tract it consists of a linear chain of many interconnecting neurons. These neurons are present between circular and longitudinal layers of smooth muscles and uh, control the muscle activity along the length of gut. Interestingly, in organs where myenteric plexus is dense, it can be subdivided into primary, secondary or tertiary plexuses all in the same intramuscular plane. Now keep in mind that uh, myenteric plexus can have both excitatory or inhibitory effects. Uh, 
the excitatory neurotransmitters are acetylcholine and substance P whereas the inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters they are nitric oxide and uh, VIP that is vasoactive intestinal peptide interestingly these uh, inhibitory signals they are useful for inhibiting some of intestinal sphincter muscles for the movement of food along the successive segments such as uh, pyloric sphincter which controls the emptying of stomach and the sphincter of uh, ileocecal valve controlling the emptying from small intestine into cecum well the overall effects of the stimulation of myenteric plexus are uh, an increased tone of gut wall increased intensity of uh, rhythmical contraction increased rate of uh, uh, not only the rate but also the increased velocity of the conduction of excitatory waves along the gut wall well i can i can sense your boredom so let's uh, spice it up with some applied physiology you see a uh, submucosal and myenteric plexus neuropathy it can impair motility for example a uh, protozoan infestation of uh, these plexus neurons it can lead to chagas disease which causes distension and uh, structural enlargements of esophagus and colon what happens that uh, regions with uh, neuropathy they can constrict but not relax the muscular layers now the asymptomatic uh, sections continue to deliver food which is retained just proximal to the constricted area and uh, this retention stretches these areas and over time enlarges and contorts them another uh, somewhat similar pathology is uh, hirschsprung disease in other words you can call it mega colon it's a congenital abnormality of uh, colonic motility in which there is a lack or deficiency of uh, ganglion cells in the myenteric plexus and submucosal plexus in a segment of sigmoid colon so there is a aganglionic mega colon now the cause of uh, aganglionic area it could be uh, failure of uh, normal cranial to caudal migration of neural crest cells during the development or a mutation in uh, the gene of a uh, endothelin b receptor which is required for normal migration of the crest cells well the disease is characterized by anorexia abdominal distension and lassitude children with this disease they defecate infrequently probably once only every week now why i am giving all this detail because dear students uh, there could be a university or a test questions to write a short note on mega colon this disease is uh, diagnosed in uh, infancy when uh, the defecation reflex and the normal peristalsis fails to occur in affected region and uh, bowel movements are rare occurring once every several days which allows tremendous quantities of fecal matter to accumulate in uh, colon and resulting in distended colon now how to get rid of this evil you see the symptoms can be completely relieved if the aganglionic segment is uh, surgically removed and the portion of the colon above it anastomose to the rectum
Well, uh, so far our discussion involved the effects brought about by the control system. Do you wonder how does the system gets its feedback? So, uh, so let's dig in. Our enteric nervous system, it receives the sensory inputs from the receptors present in the epithelium. Mainly three types of sensory receptors, they are present in the wall of digestive tract. And these are chemoreceptors, mechanoreceptors, and osmoreceptors. And stimulation of these receptors that elicit neural reflexes or the secretion of the hormones which alter the activity of uh, gastrointestinal effector cells. Now, um, here is the long list of various types of neurotransmitters which are secreted by the enteric neurons. And through this extensive variety of the neurotransmitters, uh, enteric system exerts multiple functions. For example, acetylcholine most often excites the gastrointestinal activity, while the norepinephrine almost always inhibit the gastrointestinal activity. Also, the epinephrine secreted from the adrenal medullae inhibit uh, gastrointestinal tract. Uh, however, specific functions of many of these uh, transmitters, they are not uh, well known. And uh, with this, we have uh, covered one modality of uh, gastrointestinal control system. Next, we jump to extrinsic nervous control it is exerted through autonomic nervous system by its uh, both divisions parasympathetic and sympathetic nervous system keep in mind that this extrinsic system connects to both the myenteric and the Meissner's plexus and that's how they influence the it influenced the activity in uh, gastrointestinal tract by modifying the activity of enteric nervous system or altering the secretion of the gastrointestinal hormones or still acting directly on the smooth muscle and the glands i'm sure by now you might have covered the topic of the autonomic nervous system and how it affects almost every aspect of our body Uh, let me uh, give you a brief account of uh, the gastrointestinal control uh, by this control modality. Starting with the uh, parasympathetic supply to the gut, it is divided into cranial and uh, sacral division. The cranial parasympathetic nerve fibers are almost entirely in the vagus nerve, except for a few parasympathetic fibers to mouth and the pharyngeal regions. Now they provide extrinsic innervation to the esophagus, stomach, pancreas and intestines down to the first half of large intestine. The sacral division of uh, parasympathetic supply to gut arises from S234 segments of the spinal cord. And these parasympathetic nerve fibers uh, pass through the pelvic nerves innervating the distal half of the large intestine all the way to NS. Keep in mind that sigmoid colon and rectum, they are better supplied with parasympathetic fibers than uh, other parts, as these fibers, they execute the defecation reflex. So now guys, quickly revise GI parasympathetics with me. They are either in the vagus nerve, which supply from esophagus up to proximal two-third of the transverse colon, or they are in the pelvic parasympathetics, supplying the distal one-third of uh, transverse colon up to anus. Keep in mind that the fibers traveling in vagus and the pelvic nerves, they are preganglionic fibers, while the postganglionic neurons of uh, the gastrointestinal parasympathetic system, they are located in the myenteric and submucosal plexuses. What are how the parasympathetics exert their action? Stimulation of parasympathetic nerves 
to gut, it results in increased activity of the enteric nervous system. This results in increased motility and relaxation of sphincters, which results in increased motor activity. And the excretions from glands in gastrointestinal tract that uh, these are also increased, which means increased secretory activity. Uh, so now you should give me the summary of the effects exerted by parasympathetic system, which will be yes, increased peristalsis and tone, relaxation of sphincters and increased digestive secretions. Okay, and with that, uh, everything clear about the parasympathetics? Good, now we get to start uh, sympathetic nerve supply. Sympathetic nerve supply to gut, which mainly is a thracolumbar discharge, as uh, you can see in this figure, these fibers, they originate from uh, T5 to L2 segments of spinal cord. So when these fibers leave the spinal cord, they enter the sympathetic chains, lateral to the spinal cord, and to the ganglia such as the celiac and uh, the mesenteric ganglia. And then the postganglionic fibers from here they supply all the gut. As you can guess, uh, the neurotransmitter in this case is norepinephrine. Now let's see how it affects our gut. Stimulation of uh, sympathetic nervous system it inhibits the activity of uh, gastrointestinal tract. Since sympathetics innervate essentially all the GIT, unlike the parasympathetics which are more extensive near oral cavity and anus, a strong stimulation of the sympathetics, it can inhibit motor movements of the gut so greatly that it can literally block the movement of food. The question is that uh, how the sympathetic system exerts effects on GIT? So it does so either by direct effect of secreted norepinephrine or by an inhibitory effect of norepinephrine on the neurons of enteric nervous system. Keep in mind that the direct effect is slight and it inhibits the intestinal tract smooth muscles. Only exception is the mucosal muscle which is excited. While the indirect effect it has major role in the sympathetics action on our gastrointestinal tract. So uh, that was the effect of uh, autonomic system but still we are not done with the nervous control yet. Uh, we will cover it uh, next time.